So once again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. There's one more character I'd like to introduce this evening uh, who is not present, and that's the organization Livable California. I suspect that many of you are familiar with Livable California. Their mission is that they're a nonprofit that advocates for empowerment of local governments to foster equitable, livable communities and truly affordable housing. It's a statewide nonpartisan group, including elected officials, nonprofit organization leaders, and individuals. They believe in community, equity, and action. And some of their principles include support housing as a basic right, fight for truly affordable housing, assure self-determination of local government, preserve quality of life in our communities, achieve smart and balanced growth, respect lifestyle choices, protect home ownership and value the American dream. So council member Koretz, with that, would you please take it away? Oh, I certainly will. And uh, thank you, Richard, for the introduction. And I hope uh, everyone is doing well during uh, these crazy times. Um, I'm happy to join you virtually, uh, my fellow members of the Sierra Club, to discuss uh, SB 9 and 10 and why I'm in opposition to both in defense of our neighborhoods, affordable housing, and the environment. In my view, this is a fight for local control against proposed giveaways to market rate developers by the state of California. This fight is to preserve the very urban fabric of our communities. It's a fight against gentrification and a fight to preserve generational wealth. It's a fight to prioritize affordable housing over luxury building in order to produce and preserve units for Californians of all incomes. And lastly, it's a fight to preserve the process of the California Environmental Quality Act so that environmental impacts are disclosed before decisions are made. In my view, we're fighting against one man's unrealistic utopian views that he wants to impose upon all Californians. Senator Scott Weiner believes and argues that single family home neighborhoods with trees and lawns are immoral and that we uh, if we scatter much denser luxury market rate residential units throughout every such neighborhood, all will be right with the world in California. And as we saw in the fight against SB 50 in 2019 and a package of nine related bills in 2020, especially SB 1120, the associated marketing mythology for SB 9 and 10 will call, cause confusion and uh, false assumptions. In reality, most cities and counties, especially in Los Angeles, are in dire need of more affordable housing. But I can tell you that consistently these bills miss that mark in obvious ways and will only lead to less affordable housing and more luxury housing. SB 9 and 10 focus on producing market rate units in contradiction to the real need for affordable housing and in contradiction to the vast majority of California's locally adopted general plans and housing elements, which contain detailed goals, policies, objectives, and programs crafted by our local governments to guide the development of very low, low, and moderate housing production. This while degrading our communities with substandard design and infrastructure, as well as inadvertently reducing protections for protected and desirable trees, potentially historic buildings, threatened species, and so many other assets in our communities by removing the CEQA process. I believe that state control of local zoning undermines not only the integrity of cities and counties, but strips residents of their ability to engage in a meaningful planning and community building process. And at the local level, we understand the politics of proximity. Land use is a local issue. The closer you are to a project, the more you may become concerned. Move away from the project, those impacts seem to be less important. Move far enough away such as Sacramento and all one sees are the hypothetical benefits. Some of our state lawmakers think that homeowners and the elected leaders of our 
482 cities and 58 counties are just trying to block the development of new housing. I think they need to stop blaming us and take a look at themselves. State regulations filled with unfunded mandates and endless, endlessly lengthy and expensive and complex processes prevent local innovation in the realm of housing production. In order to simply keep our plans current in Los Angeles, we now have the largest planning department in the nation. And if you ask any planner, they'll tell you stories of the time spent endlessly researching state laws in, either, in order to ensure compliance with even the simplest and most straightforward changes in a proposed plan. And at the same time, local planners struggle to build consensus and update plans as they explain the new realities of, of land use law to community members who stand appalled and in disbelief by state rules that were adopted without their input. Usupering local control means grassroots solutions are not given an opportunity to take hold as they're snuffed out by state rules. We must respect very varied ways of life and have a place for everyone. Let our residents and our local governments decide what should be by right and what should be discretionary. In LA, we have a wide and diverse city with plenty of room for infill development with a range of affordable units that doesn't displace stable single family neighborhoods. And at the same time, we don't need to force our single family communities to give up their way of life and their unique character. Many other opportunities to grow exist without the senseless and hostile disruption that would result from these bills if they become law. And Los Angeles, our currently adopted housing element, proves that we have the capacity and can add to our housing stock with minimal displacement if development is focused on centers and along major corridors. As our economy recovers and evolves, we'll, we'll continue to see obsolete commercial buildings and malls being reused, providing ample opportunity for new growth without displacement. And for example, I recently introduced a motion to expand adaptive reuse in the city to ensure that units will be affordable for moderate income households instead of just producing market rate luxury units. My motion will go through the process so we can perfect this concept by including stakeholder participation, understand the environmental impacts, and make sure that any proposed ordinance meets the needs and respects the aspirations of our various communities and the built environment. So what could occur if these bills passed? Senate President Atkins SB9 is a copycat of last year's SB 1120. It overrides local development standards, public participation, and forces jurisdictions to approve substandard lots. You'll see reduced yards, and reduced separation between structures, less light and air, and looming buildings. The additional units on the lots will have a crowded and unbalanced site plan, guided not, only, not by local regulation, but by pro forma. The result will be a pattern of development that our state previously defined as blight. And lastly, a CEQA, CEQA requires a local agency to prepare and certify the completion of an environmental impact report on a proposed project that may have a significant impact on the environment. It's worth noting that CEQA does not apply to the approval of ministerial projects, thereby exempting the approval of projects from the environmental review process. Additionally, SB 9 would remove public participation and the intergovernmental coordination required by CEQA and the Coastal Act. It would exempt local governments from being required to hold public hearings for coastal development permit applications for housing developments and urban lot splits pursuant to the bill's provisions. And then there's SB 10, which Senator Weiner says provide cities with a powerful, fast, and effective tool to allow light touch density exactly where it should be, near jobs, near public transportation, and in existing urban areas. SB 10 will help 
move California away from a sprawl-based housing policy and toward a more sustainable, equitable, and effective housing policy. So that's what he says about his bill. But what Senator Weiner doesn't tell you is that SB 10 will allow cities to ignore the general plan of a city or county. Uh, the general plan is both a constitutional requirement and a living document created with extensive community outreach and environmental study to build a consensus about how a community will grow. It's a myth to think the general plans are static and inflexible. Rather, they ensure orderly development and commensurate infrastructure. This bill creates inconsistency between the general plan and zoning. And in addition to removing environmental review, uh, the result will be blight, environmental degradation, and lost opportunities of generational wealth for Californians. As land title is passed from homeowners to developers and real estate syndicates. And as single family homes are replaced with small apartment buildings over five units that can only be financed as commercial properties. If we wanna meet our greenhouse gas goals, we need to place affordable housing next to transit. A 2018 Metro survey of bus riders found that just 12% of passengers had a household income greater than $50,000, and 60% of riders had an income below $20,000. SB 10 doesn't require affordable housing within half a mile of transit. It builds luxury housing near transit for people that will never take transit. And while the preamble of SB 10 alludes to affordable housing production and finds that, quote, enduring adequate production of affordable housing is a matter of statewide concern and not a municipal affair, unquote, no provision of the bill sets aside affordable housing. In my view, clearly the constituency of both SB 9 and 10 are market rate developers who are uninterested in utilizing the existing affordable housing programs, such as the density bonus provisions of that law. In 2020, SB 1120 missed passing by a hair, literally passing at midnight on the last day and not leaving time to be transmitted from one house to the other. This was par partly because everyone, including myself, was appropriately focused on COVID, law enforcement reform, homelessness, and, and our economic disaster, uh, all of which we still face. But in 2021, I'm not letting these bills out of my sight. And I'm in front and leading our city to ensure that we're clear about what these bills do. I wanna remind you that Senator Scott Weiner just doesn't and won't take the hint that his housing ideas are wrong for California. It's terrible for LA but even his hometown of San Francisco hates them as well. For example, regarding SB 50, according to his own Twitter feed uh, from December 17th, 2019, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors just voted again to oppose SB 50. The board has now voted to oppose it not once, not twice, but three times. We get it, you don't like it. Well, for some reason, Scott keeps recycling the same bad ideas. And I wanna get across the point across to state legislators that we are not ignoring the real problems. We're trying to address them, but these bills and destroying neighborhoods are not the answer. We have 40,000 homeless people in the city of Los Angeles and building homeless, building luxury units will not trickle down to the homeless in Los Angeles and make housing affordable. Building affordable housing will, which should be our real goal and the direction that I would like to see these bills go in instead of just being the giveaway to developers that they are. Uh, I hope uh, Sierra Club members will take a good look at these bills and that the Sierra Club will oppose them. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, council member Koretz. Uh, we appreciate your input and information on this issue. Uh, Jill, would you like to take the floor? 
Yeah, so Paul said everything that I was going to say. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go, everything he said was right on target. Uh, if I were writing a story, I could just quote it directly. Um, I'm just going to go straight to my uh, uh, screen, screen sharing of my uh, PowerPoint. It's, it's a fairly painless PowerPoint. And I'm just going to walk through what kind of what Paul just said, except in some visuals with some bullet items and so on. So if you don't mind, folks, I'm going to hit screen share, and I'm going to bring in my um, bring in my PowerPoint. Can you see it? Okay. We got it. Okay, you can see it. Okay, good. So um, is it in the middle? Can everybody? Is it in the right spot on the on the screen? Yes. Okay. So um, SB nine, as Paul said, it's a copycat of uh, SB eleven twenty. It kills single family zoning in California. There's nothing like it in the nation. Oregon is the only state to approve um, wipe out a single family zoning with duplexes. Uh, but in fact, California beat them when they allowed the ADUs two years ago. California was in fact the very first uh, state to go uh, statewide with ending single family zoning by allowing ADUs almost everywhere. Those are granny flats. Oregon is just now uh, going for that. They're calling them duplexes. And uh, they're start, they started about five weeks ago, their, their new law. They're going to put it in in phases. Nobody knows how it's going to turn out. I have heard legislators tell me uh, to my face that Oregon's uh, duplex program is going incredibly well and is a huge success. Well, it just started. And that's not true. <laughs> Nobody knows. So you got to be careful. you got to be careful when these things come up. Okay, so SB9 upzones all single family uh, lots and you'll see on this page some yellow highlighting because about two hours ago I got an email from a top attorney in, in California who has found some new wording, some kind of not new wording, but unnoticed wording in SB9 that he says me, me allows 10 units instead of eight units. Most of the media are covering it as a duplex bill. This is not true. The media are just overwhelmed. They don't have time. They hear from somebody, usually Scott Weiner and Tony Atkins, <laughs> that it's duplexes, and that's what they report. Um, so you, it allows up to 10, as I understand it now. There are, there are different scenarios where you can do four or six or eight units where one single family home is now. The yards will be wiped out. The setback is only four feet required. So permeable soil, all of that gone. Um, you can do the four and six unit projects by right. You, that's that second bullet item. The eight unit projects are, um, the cities have a certain amount of leeway. We can't really figure out how that's gonna be interpreted by leg the legislature, but it allows the cities to step in and say, okay, eight is, is too many. You gotta go back and do one of the other ones. I don't know what the rules are for the 10 unit because we're just now deciphering. We didn't know about the 10 units. It's brand new information. Um, as Paul said on my bullet four, it's a gift to market rate rental giants to overrun homeowner areas. Um, millions of Californians need affordable housing and SB9 does not require any of the new units put into um, neighborhoods and wiping out single family, none of them need to be affordable. They can all be market rate or luxury. Um, SB9 at the very bottom ends public hearings for multiple homes on single family lots in the coastal zones. So those, those hearings are not gonna happen. The coastal zones are just considered regular land and it's nothing special. So that's that's really a big blow, I think. Uh, next next um, slide, um, it's being sold as, sold as a duplex bill. And that, that almost worked in 2020. One of the reasons Paul mentioned that the bill almost passed and it, 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 it passed on the assembly side a couple minutes before midnight on August 31st. And I was watching, it was really very dramatic even though it was very wonky, it was very dramatic. And there was only like four minutes to go. And some lobbyists said, well, they have the votes but we've got the clock. And I didn't know what that meant. What, what does that mean we've got the clock? And he said, well, they can't get it across the, the hall fast enough to the Senate side to get it approved. There's only four minutes left. So we're gonna win on the clock. And I'd never, I had never, I've, I've covered Sacramento for years. And I just, you know, Paul knows that stuff because he used to be in the assembly, but I didn't know, I didn't know. So it was really amazing when they wiped it out by some people were talking really slow when they got the microphone and they ran down the clock. That's what happened. 
So there's three scenarios under um, this bill, and I believe now we're going to find out about a fourth scenario allowing 10 units. One of the results in four units where one home is now, that's because it goes hand in hand with our granny flat laws. This, this bill is not a standalone um, bill. It builds on the granny flats already allowed. Everything already allowed plus this. That's how you have to think about it. That's why the media are so confused and all of almost all of the stories, I, have, I don't think I've seen an accurate story yet. Scenario two allows six units. Uh, again, the ADUs pl play a very key role in what's called, the, I don't know if you pronounce it, JDU. Paul, how do you pronounce that? It's the junior accessory dwelling units. Is it? Hey, I, I, I've never said the word, so I, okay. I, don't <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how to say it, but it's ADUs and then is it JDU? I don't know. Um, then the third one uh, results in eight units where one home is now, and that's the one where the cities can come in and go, well, we're not so sure. But we can't tell from the wording in the bill, is this, we, it's not hearings, and it doesn't allow any neighborhood input, but is it is it over the counter, like case by case, or how are they going to do that? We don't know. Now, as I said, we just learned about the horrible possibility of 10 units. Now, what's that going to look like? Well, Redondo Beach, um, Redondo Beach, um, uh, had a, an interesting situation about 30 years ago where they, they were rezoning their city and the developers found out that they were changing the zoning and came in and built what are called this tall and skinnies. And you can see them from Google Earth right here. They're fourplexes on 1200 square feet of land and they have a garage in front and they wipe out all virtually all. There's a little tiny, you can see a little tiny backyard behind some of them with a few trees. Now, um, this bill is far more dense than that. It's far more dense. These are four units. This bill allows six, eight, or 10 units. The lots can be as small as 1,200 square feet. So it's, it wipes out all greenery. It wipes out all yards. It's, it's a paving over of whatever um, streets developers most want to go after because it's allowed everywhere. OK, I just thought so that visual is. It, it always it always blows me away. Okay, now the media. How did this happen? How did they not understand that it wasn't a duplex bill? Look at the look at the stories. L.A. Times allows a duplex. San Francisco Chronicle allows the people to split lots and convert their homes into duplexes. San Diego Union Tribune allows duplexes. Cal Matters, which is a wonky bunch of planners who write stuff. These were planners who wrote this, who got snookered by the, the wording, allows duplexes. And the real deal allows duplexes. Last week, New York Times op-ed by Ezra Klein called it a modest duplex bill. So they've had a whole year now of, of, of phone calls and letters to the editor and people trying to wake them up. And they are absolutely addicted to this misreporting of the bill. We're going to have to work on it hard this year, folks, to get them to understand. Let's at least have a debate over what the bill really is going to do instead of this false narrative, which I have to give Wiener credit for. He he called it a duplex bill at every possibility, and it was picked up by the media. Okay, and then Paul went into the second bad bill this year, the other worst bill. It's SB 10 by Wiener, and last year it was SB 902. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it does to the right to voter initiative. Our, it's a 108 year old constitutional right that we can put things on the ballot by gathering signatures and we can pass laws and no city council can overturn what we do. This bill allows any municipality, that would be any county supervisors or any city to nullify city initiative, voter approved laws that protect land from developers in some in any form whatever it is if it's a height limit if it's protection of a shoreline hills canyons urban boundaries open space anything that voters have approved and and uh, you'll see my second bullet item i did a quick search of maybe four or five hours one day and found 40 such protections in california just in the last couple of decades there are probably many that go back to the 40s and 50s and 60s that are long-standing protections of canyons and uh, shorelines and so on. Um, this puts them all at risk. And of course, as a journalist, my first thought was, oh my God, what's gonna happen is developers are gonna start funding um, city council races in cities that have small councils, like five or seven members. 
and quickly turn them into majority developer controlled and undo all of these voter initiatives. I mean, it's it's one of the worst ideas I have ever seen in a bill. It got no coverage last year, but it's back. Um, so the second part, uh, it's a two-part bill and it's, it's SB 10. It also allows what Paul was talking about, 10 unit market rate projects almost everywhere. And this brings in an, an issue that I know is at the deep heart of Sierra Club and that is urban infill. Um, they don't identify what they mean by urban infill in the, in the bill, but I did some searching as to what the state has been um, interpreting as urban infill, and they call it underutilized land. It can't be um, uh, industrial and it can't be agricultural, but it can be underutilized land. Well, you've all been involved in battles in Los Angeles over what is underutilized land because the city is allowing housing to be torn down to build new housing. Hollywood is a, a hotbed of battles over trying to save housing um, from new luxury housing with often fewer affordable units than are going to be wiped out. Those were called underutilized and that was one of the big arguments. So when we come to a, a word, a, a kind of a phrase of art such as urban infill, that should scare everyone. That is going to be um, abused incredibly if this law goes through. The second, and, and the, the only one in that list that makes any sense that I that you can actually identify that I, what it will do is the transit rich area because they define it one half mile, which Paul already mentioned, one half mile from uh, uh, heavy transit pickup areas. Jobs rich is another a, a kind of a phrase of art that is going to scare you when I tell you what they're going to do. A state entity, a board of people are going to sit down and decide the building that you're proposing, this 10 unit building you're proposing um, on land that's only a single family zoning, for example. Um, will the people who move into it have shorter commutes than they have right now? That's what the state is going to be deciding. The state is not capable of figuring that out. Nobody can figure that out, but they're gonna use this magical wand and they're going to decide, this building should be allowed because the people who move into it are gonna have a shorter commute than if they didn't move into it. it it's it, it's like a some kind of a nightmare. I mean, there's no way the state, which can't even get in unemployment checks out, can figure out something at that level. It's, it's completely impossible. A city council wouldn't be able to either and they're closer to the ground. So uh, it, this, is a, this is a really bad bill. Moving on to the next, um, okay. Will we let California be the next Vancouver? Livable California last week had Professor Patrick Condon from the University of British Columbia as its key speaker. We had a huge crowd of people show up. He was a major backer of the very sort of upzoning we're talking about in SB 9 and SB 10. He fought for it for years in Vancouver and they upzoned a huge amount of Vancouver and Vancouver essentially no longer has single family zoning. There is some, but it's it's been overrun by all kinds of multiple units. And the argument that, that Professor Condon made and all of them made, um, they were about seven or eight years ahead of us in making this argument. We're making it now through Scott Weiner and Tony Atkins is that it will create affordable housing. By having as much housing as possible, you will create affordable housing. Um, Vancouver is the, is the reality and it, it, it remained expensive. It is the second most expensive city in North America and prices didn't go down a penny. Uh, the exact same, uh, you can see right here, exact same um, pri price per square foot. And the evidence he said is indis indisputable. He's writing, he's written a book about it called Sick Cities. This obsession with upzoning as if this is going to drive down prices, it drives them up. And the reason is, that it causes vast increases in the land value. And once you have a really expensive piece of land, you cannot create affordable housing. Uh, and as he says in his, in his um, podcast, and as he said last week, it's not the NIMBYs that are the problem at the very bottom there. It's the global increase in land, in land value in urban areas that's the problem. And he is blaming it on upzoning. Upzoning creates 
unaffordability. It's just a bad idea, but it's it's gripping a lot of groups and people right now. It's it's popular. It's been popular for about well, it's been popular in 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 um, Vancouver for over a decade. In California, we we picked up on it about four years ago with Scott Weiner. Um, okay, next, uh, talk about where do we get affordable housing actually. Paul mentioned this. Um, the only way to get affordable housing is actually to pay for it. It costs extra money to make affordable housing um, affordable. So this is a this is a study of what's been going on in California um, for, for the last several years. And you can see that um, the, the lime, kind of that lime color is um, what the, the goal was that all the cities were ordered to come up with that much affordable housing, that lime uh, block on the left side, very low and low income. How much did the cities come up with? Well, they came up with that little tiny aqua square there. Why? Because they don't have the money. The money is all in the state. The state has all of the, there's a tiny bit of money in the, at, the, at the city level for affordable housing, but very little. It's always been that way. The state has the money. Uh, how much did they approve in market rate in the cities? Well, they were supposed to approve, approve that, that lime square you see there, almost the same size as the very low and low income. They, they were supposed to have about, about the same amount of market rate. But the only thing that came before them that was proposed to them by developers was market rate. And so they approved far more market rate than we need. And we have a glut and you have incredible people running around saying we don't have enough market rate. There is a major glut in California of market rate. Hollywood has a 10% uh, vacancy rate, downtown vacancy rate. You know, well, of course, now since the COVID, people are abandoning San Francisco. It's got massive vacancy rates, but that's partly because of COVID. But I'm talking about pre-COVID, everybody. So we're, we're talking about a complete lack of funding. Um, now, I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, what happened? Where did the money go? Well, right after the crash in 2008, California almost went broke. And so in um, 2010, they voted to take back all of the money that the cities were being given for affordable housing. It was done through re redevelopment agencies, which were not popular, but they did ma manage to build a lot of affordable housing. Uh, so Jerry Brown took away defunded affordable housing at the city level, he took it all back, put it into the budget, which was really hurting, and uh, everybody sort of understood. But when the, when the revenues surged back up, you can see the surge here on the, on the aqua side, just went crazy way, way up. Um, that, that, didn't, that didn't get copied here. We had just a little tiny bit. This is something that was approved by voters right here. Voters approved some special money in 2018. So the state abandoned affordable housing funding. And as the years went on, they began to blame the cities more and more for not approving affordable housing. So it's been a kind of a, almost like a nightmarish situation where the cities are being blamed. Even the media sometimes blame the cities for not approving affordable housing. There isn't any money. They got, you know, I'm going to say they got screwed, if you don't mind. Okay, a major hit on the environment. If you look at all of these kind of depressing things I've just shown you, I hate to say, in addition to all these other problems, both of them were going to wreak destruction on the urban tree canopies across California. When we can't afford that, obviously, we have heating, heat islands, a major, we're going to have major deaths. Uh, in the next uh, several decades, we're up in Los Angeles, as I understand it, they're expecting 2,000 deaths per year from the heat island effect, unless the city cools down. And the only way to cool, there are two ways to cool down. And one is you have to rebuild your urban tree canopy. We're right in the middle of bills that are saying we're going to tear down the urban tree canopy. We're going to wipe it out. We're going to kill the yards, which are awful uh, elitist things. It's, it's, it's really incredible how interesting the spin is on this issue. So by destroying uh, yards, we also pave over the permeable soil and we set up a real problem with runoff and just incredible, I, it's hard to describe all the environmental disasters that can happen if we do this. Um, both SB9 and SB10 wipe out our defensible spaces between the buildings. And I'll go back to, to the Redondo Beach picture. This is gonna be your defensible space between buildings. 
when they're done. And, and so we, it's, it's incredible that the, the debate is not focusing on these real, real, real issues. Um, a lot of burn areas, as I'm sure you know, big burn areas in the last couple of years are not inside the severe fire hazard zones that are often exempt from density. They're outside those zones. They've jumped the zones, they've jumped the freeways, and they've burned down to the oceans. So the, 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 these kind of fire hazard zones are, are getting more and more meaningless. Um, now, the final thing is it, it attacks, SB 10 attacks this concept of voter approved open space and protected lands. It's, it's incredible that they're doing this, that they're, this isn't a front page story in the LA Times. It's, it's hard, I mean, I, I, I kind of understand it because the newsrooms have been decimated and it's easy to pass complicated bills that are filled with lies because there's no media left in Sacramento. A very, very tiny group of people cover Sacramento. When I covered the Arnold era, there were 50 reporters regularly covering Sacramento. I think there are less than 10 now, and they just, there's no way to keep up with what's going on. There are going to be 3,000 bills this year, and bad things are going to happen. So uh, that's really depressing. I'm sorry. I'm going to unstop the screen share. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it can be, it can be stopped. And there are a couple of good bills. SB 15 by Portentino is a very good bill, and I'm happy to ask answer questions about that later on. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jill. Uh, that was a great presentation, very informative, and raises a lot of questions, I think. There are a lot of questions. I'm not sure if they're addressed to anyone in the that, that, that have come up in the chat. So uh, perhaps if I ask everyone, uh, let me see. I'm going to ask everyone to unmute. If that's okay, uh, Jill and Paul, is that all right if I ask everyone to unmute so we can have a casual conversation among us? Hey, it's fine. And I think either of us can take a shot at answering the questions. Okay, that's great. And I would like to remind everyone that you're asked to limit your questions or your remarks to two minutes or less so we can answer everyone's questions. So here we go. So you all are asked to unmute and welcome to the conversation. Uh, let's see, I have a question here. C.T. Williams, are you there? I'm sorry, try that again to unmute please. Hmm. Hello, hello. There you go. Okay, uh, Dr. Tom Williams, uh, LA 32 Neighborhood Council, life member of Sierra Club. Only one real question for both Paul and Jill. What do you think of the current initial study and project description for the housing element upgrade by the city of Los Angeles? Department of City Planning. Yeah. That's it. What do you think about it? I'm not sure that I can say I'm that up on it. So I, it's hard for me to offer an opinion yet. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't read it yet. I know all of the cities are updating their housing elements and they're being required to add massive amounts of density under the what's called RENA. Uh, and there's a huge uh, debate because the, the growth numbers have doubled, but the city of Los Angeles has stagnant population as does most of California's urban areas. So there's a, there's a real battle going on as to why cities are being asked to double their zoning. Um, I don't know anything about LA's specific uh, housing element, but uh, this, yep. this war is unfolding. Yesterday was the deadline for scoping comments. We were given 30 days and uh, the initial plan is out, so it's available. That's all. Well, I'm sure my planning director has read it, but we haven't discussed it, and I haven't read it yet, honestly. Um, Tom, do you have any point of view on it? 
for because I'm sure you responded. <laughs> yes, piece uh, of trash. Tom, ah, um, for all of you that don't know Tom, Tom's a uh, he's uh, he's our oil and gas expert also. Plus, he's an expert on all our CEQA issues, and uh, he's a major uh, stanchion for us. Uh, for learning all about CEQA. One, and one, one of my backgrounds is I built, I helped build, directed the building of 3,824 apartments in three calendar years and had two year waiting list. That's all. You're our housing solution. <laughs> Uh, Tom, could you forward me your, this is Patricia calling or uh, speaking, could you forward me those comments that you made and I could forward them also to, to Jill and to uh, Paul? I will. Thank you. So um, this is uh, Catherine Campbell speaking. I'm wondering if either of you have any examples that you can put forward as positive solutions for increasing uh, both moderate and low income housing in these scenarios. Jill, you mentioned that the state needs to at least return funding to the prior level, but are there any models that you've seen nationally or internationally for how to do that in uh, a reasonable time frame that could make an impact on the kind of problems that we're experiencing in California? I don't know that that's based on, on other places, but uh, just on what's happening now on talking to property owners, I think there are a number of office buildings that are vacant or fairly vacant that uh, we may anticipate seeing developers uh, convert to housing mm -hmm. and uh, the effort to uh, make that uh, largely affordable would be uh, uh, an approach. Um, also uh, uh, pushing for more development um, on commercial streets rather than disrupting neighborhoods. Uh, there are a lot of empty buildings right now. Um, some that are, are one story that could be three stories in mixed use or four stories on a commercial street and add a number of units again without having to displace anyone or disrupt single family neighborhoods or uh, which the city already does in its TOC developments, uh, demolish a rent controlled building and replace it with uh, a new market rate building. And frankly, under the current circumstances, a developer could demo a building and build the exact same building. And because they'd get out from under rent control and because the value that's attached to new construction, they would make a profit. So we incentivize demolishing older buildings where there are often people that can't afford a rent other than what they're paying now. But because of Costa Hawkins, once they're out, no other apartment building when it's vacated, even if it's almost exactly the same, same, same uh, level of condition, uh, same number of years old, uh, it's not going to be uh, affordable. It's going to be now a luxury market rate to uh, rent. So that's something I would do. And I could see building a lot of affordable housing on abandoned mall sites. And I know uh, malls are looking at a lot of housing in general. Uh, a number of them are looking at may continuing to be malls, but eliminating maybe half the space and building building housing. And so they have at least a built-in market of the people that live there um, as a base. So even though a number of people are using Amazon, if you live next door to all the things you want to shop at, you might just walk 50 feet and, and go shopping in a mall. So that change is happening and we could encourage more of that housing to be affordable housing. I'd like to weigh in and agree strongly with what Paul just said. And that's very similar to what Portentino is trying to do. It's not exactly the same, but it's reuse of existing buildings. Yeah. And I know that some of you have read the kind of infamous and famous study called The Greenest Building. And The Greenest Building is a, is a study by the research arm of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, in which they found that the new luxury buildings 
suck up so much energy and have so much incredible supply line problems from far away places where the marble is cut and where the steel is made and just goes on and on. But if you actually measure what you're doing uh, to the environment, when you tear things down and put in a brand new building, it's shocking, shocking amounts of greenhouse gases. And that's why um, the, the, green, the greenest building is, is a really wonderful study about, hey, take what you've got that is underutilized, that is empty, that is a mall, that is whatever, and rebuild it. And that's what Portentino is trying to do. Uh, his bill died in a, a committee. I don't remember when last year. Um, it, it didn't get the attention of the really horrible bills, but it's a smart bill about reusing existing idle buildings. So it's probably, it might not And it be makes total sense under COVID. So even if someone acted like they had a good reason last year to oppose it, they might change their mind if we yeah, maybe nudge them. <laughs> So thank, Paul's you know, right on target, I think, with what he's talking about. I'd like to ask a, a technical question. Um, you know, the repurposing of offices, um, it's, it's, to me, it sounds like a very good idea. Um, and if there's, if there's an owner, when you say repurposing, who's going to fund it? The owner or will a developer come in and do it? And then will you still result in market price situations there? Well, it, I mean, what's it the funding be, situation? It yeah. could be either one, but unless okay. someone provides extra funding for affordable housing, either the, the existing office building owner or a developer that buys it would, would put in as much market rate housing as they're legally allowed to. Um, but I think it's, it's an opportunity for the city to buy some of these buildings and, and, the, and create affordable housing. It's just a question of where the money comes from, and that's not easy. Well, that, that's the uh, question we have to where- We on some of it from the federal yeah. government, which- Okay, yeah, that's the question. Where's the money coming from? Yeah, yeah, that's the big question, yeah. yeah. Suzanne, do you have a question? Yeah, I'd like to throw in a couple of thoughts. For those who don't know me, I'm a social ethicist, analyst, and psychologist. And I'm focused on changing the conversation because we're busy fighting these two bills and we have to on one hand. But on the other hand, uh, I'd like to see us, and I, and I have a draft of something I've done, but I need a drafts person or architect to make it look beautiful. And found out it's being done in, in, in old Covina's, an old part of Covina, and then another friend who's an arborist and uh, from the Netherlands said, oh, we're doing stuff like that there, which uh, piggybacks on what Paul Caret said about the uh, going into the upper levels, you know, the one to the three stories. And if we could get this drawing or maybe an even better one that what, I, what I've conceptualized that would, you know, reduce and reuse and actually add to the trees because of how the second story would be done, but if we could get that, and I know from my history in Culver City, first of all, our five council people, I feel are very decent people. They're split down the middle between, uh, you know, pro and con on the housing thing, because the ones who really want it are really trying to address homelessness, which we realize is like uh, the uh, trickle down economy, the trickle down housing isn't gonna provide what's needed. So, um, so, but if we can get something out to all of our activists that's, that's hands-on, that's visual, so it moves from being abstract concept into something a council person can see and look at and then back it up with a bullets of things that both Paul and Jill have said and start engaging in the conversation. And we also need to find a meme that moves away from, you know, we're NIMBYs and all the nonsense that's uh, going on. Psychologically, just as we got the meme going, because I told people to say, ban fracking is never gonna work. Paul Williams had said, the only way oil leaves is when they have to pay. So we created the meme of the, uh, uh, the uh, we started with a billion dollar security bond and we also started with 1000 foot setback when SB4 came out on the oil field and the dangers. 
And then when people bought into it, we raised it up to 2,500 foot setback because there was more science to back that and the uh, two and a half billion. And people bought into that and it gave us pushback, which we could do in Culver City uh, to demand that our health and our security, since it's seismic, et cetera, needed to be protected. So if we can use something like that where we get the positive meme and pictures and then start inundating to get across our narrative that as Jill pointed out, the media has all but destroyed. So if someone can work with me who knows how to use AutoCAD or whatever, mm -hmm. I'd love to at least get this out. Maybe somebody or others could even improve on it that creates the recycling, the carbon, uh, you know, heat sinks, et cetera, et cetera. And provides both uh, really low income and, uh, you know, homelessness addressing plus the more affordable and moderate. Thank Suzanne, you. Suzanne. This minute. Thank you for thank you for that idea. And hopefully somebody uh, online this evening will be able to meet your needs. Uh, I have a question. Joan Davidson uh, asked when Wait, land so, is so before, expensive. And before the next question, can I just uh, put in an off topic thank you to Culver City for what they're doing in terms of uh, trying to amortize their oil fields uh, over the course of five years because it'll blaze a trail for us where we've been getting yes. advised that we would probably have to amortize things over 20 years, which uh, I, I think is total BS, but uh, it helps to have a city take the step ahead of us and will help us get to where we're trying to go. Hmm. Yes. Great. Um, Joan asked, when the land is so expensive in some cities, what builder can afford to build affordable housing? Well, and I think the answer is that given the choice, they wouldn't. Um, <laughs> they would certainly build luxury housing and, and hope for the biggest profit possible. Of course. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can do something with our zoning and look at ways to incentivize at least moderate workforce housing, which we also have a huge uh, shortfall of. Um, and it may take some subsidies, but uh, I think if we find a way through zoning to make it more permissive to build more reasonably priced housing, um, that may be one way to do it. Paul, can you, you, you talked about the city's general plans and that these bills overrode those and how city's general plans were inclusive and developed with a lot of input. And I wonder if you can, let us all know when the city of Los Angeles's general plan update is going to come back online in an inclusive, transparent way. It, it, it kicked off several years ago and then the rug was pulled out and now no one knows what's happening. Is that going to move forward again so that we have that to stand on rather than just saying that these general plans are important and inclusive and collaborative? I would have to say that I do not know more than anybody else about uh, when that will happen or if it will happen. Are any council members looking to the planning department and asking them to please uh, begin that process again since it is so important to this very issue? I think that's a very good question. I'm not sure if anybody is, uh, is doing that, but uh, I suspect based on your question that uh, that will happen in the future. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Daniel Skolnick, my, my planning director, is on uh, this call, but if he is, he might have uh, more of an idea of whether this is moving forward at all. Daniel, are you there or are you not there? I guess he's not. Um, but I, I will try to find that out uh, if anything is in the works. I suspect it, it is not moving at, at any great pace. And uh, uh, with, with our budget shortfall, it's, it's a good excuse for the planning department not to be doing that as well. So it's even less likely. But uh, I think that's a good suggestion and we, we will take a good look at it. Can you hear me? Oh, Daniel, Hello? is that you? Yes, it is. Uh, I, I just, sorry, I was having issues connecting. Um, the community plan process is still happening, and there's still a number of uh, plans 
that are being worked on. Uh, with COVID, it looked like the work program disappeared for a while, but it was still still moving forward. Um, and even though it's slowed down a bit, um, things are, are still happening. In fact, there's even uh, a community plan going to commission this Thursday for Hollywood, although that's been in the works for many, many years now. Uh, so a little, little slow down, a little hiccup, but it's, it's still happening uh, and the department's adapting. Question. I have a comment. This is Kathy Knight, um, and I live in Santa Monica. And um, let me see. Am I muted? No, you were here. Okay. okay. Um, and one of the things that we realized is that um, we elected some people to the city council that cared about the neighborhoods here. Finally, we got some good people on, and. Um, one of the things we realized is that the last one, SB, the other bills that Weiner put through almost passed. It was so frightening how close it came. And that this time we really need to stop these bills in Santa Monica, we decided at the committee levels, you know, and not wait till there's a final vote. So um, our Santa Monica City Council sent a letter uh, saying that we're concerned about, about these two bills and we don't support them the way they are. And um, so I just, you know, personally, um, I want to say that that we need to stop. We need we need to show the Senate and, um, that that there is not support for these bills way ahead of time, and not wait for the end of the line vote. And um, in terms of the Sierra Club, I think we haven't. I just want to make it clear. We I don't think we've actually taken a stand at this point, just as we know this. But this this meeting is to educate everybody. And um, so I personally am really, really against this. It's, it's, uh, my neighborhood is already changing from single family homes being torn down to um, mega, mega mansion type things. And it's, it's, really, it's really sad. And uh, anyway, I, I have a 50, 1953 home and the backyard is huge. And I just walk outside and look out and I feel, I feel relaxed. <laughs> just looking out and just seeing nature. It's, it's you know, something we just need to keep for our kids, for our children. Okay, thank you. Well, and I agree with you. And this time, rather than uh, introducing a motion against SB 1120 months after it was introduced, again, because we were focused elsewhere, um, this year, uh, almost immediately on the introduction of SB 9 and 10, I introduced a resolution to oppose it. Uh, the problem is that uh, there certainly is a lot of support for developers on uh, on the LA City Council, so it 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 takes a while to work our way past that to uh, get bills uh, motions in opposition to the, to bills like this. So we're we're on it, um, but uh, I'm not sure how quickly it'll happen. I think the Sierra Club could do it more quickly. Hey, Richard. Thank you, you Council Member. Uh, Diane, if you could hold on. Uh, John Heath has had his hand up. John, do you have a question? Sure. Thanks, Richard, and thanks to everybody for, for doing this. Thanks to Suzanne De Benedettis for inviting me. I'm the president of United Homeowners Association. We're the little unincorporated community right next to your favorite plot of land, the Inglewood oil field. And I was listening <laughs> to, I think it was Tom that was speaking earlier, who's the oil and gas expert we probably need to have a separate conversation because we had to file a sequel lawsuit to stop an 88 unit condo development right across the street from that little plot of land. So we'll follow up on that, but real fast, uh, council member Koretz and Jill, thanks for your insight as always. I wanted to ask the councilman, what's the chances of amending his resolutions, which we weighed in on in support of, and we're gonna soon be encouraging the entire council to support those. I'm part of a group called United Neighbors, which is a coalition of homeowners groups across the region. And I'd encourage all of you to consider joining and supporting that effort. Um, but what's the chance of amending those resolutions to remove the, the requirement that the mayor concur so that once the city council adopts that, it would just be the policy of the city and you guys can go forward and go forth and send that to our friends in Sacramento. And then also lastly, uh, what if any benefit might there be in terms of pushing affordable housing to looking at 
repealing Article 34 from the California Constitution, which is a crazy holdover from days gone by when a bunch of white folks thought that they needed to stop public housing because they didn't want certain people living in their neighborhoods. Uh, obviously, we have an affordable housing crisis and whatever we can do to make it easier uh, and less bureaucratic to build affordable housing, we should do it. Thoughts? Well, I'm not familiar with Article 34. Uh, what, what does it actually do? That's the, that's the uh, constitutional amendment that was adopted by a bunch of folks in the early 50s. It basically requires a public vote to be held whenever there's public housing. So anytime I think, anytime the city has uh, a project that public funds is going into, there's some uh, attestation or affirmation that has to be made that, you know, this many units is going up, going against a certain allocation. I think the last time the city uh, took that vote was in 2008. So they're reaching the end of their allotted public units. So that's something I think the mayor has been looking at, but that's article 34. And I don't, I don't think in our previous opposition to uh, Scott Weiner's bills and, and others that uh, uh, the mayor caused any trouble for them. So uh, it's, it's very rare that he's overridden the council policy. I think it's happened once since I've been on council uh, over the course of two mayors. So I thought, I thought what happened before was that he just, he didn't concur and therefore there was no clear message coming from LA that this was the official position of the city. Maybe I misunderstood that. Uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that, so I'll have to double check. I know there was an effort on a different bill by Wiener, um, which was the 4 a.m. bar bill to uh, allow uh, bars in Los Angeles and a number of other cities to stay open till 4 a.m which I thought was an equally bad idea and led the opposition to, to that one. And uh, to his colleagues, uh, Scott Weiner said, because the mayor was supportive, that that was why LA was included, but that was not the policy of the city of Los Angeles. That was just the mayor. So I flew up a couple of times to speak against it in committees um, to make sure they knew that uh, the council was not in support of the bill. And the first year we were not in support, but in, in later years, we were actually formally in opposition. So uh, again, that can be confusing based on what the mayor's uh, folks uh, who do the lobbying for the city of Los Angeles are saying. So once in a while, we just have to go up and clarify it ourselves. I wanted to say something about John's mentioning of, of uh, 34. Uh, there is some talk, John, and John Heath is always ahead of the curve on this stuff. Uh, I don't know where you, 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 what you read, he always knows stuff ahead of everybody else. But this, um, this 34, Article, Article 34, uh, it, it is from a re really bad time in California, and it was a racist approach to stop um, public housing by requiring voter approval of public housing. And uh, there's a lot of talk about getting rid of it now. Uh, I, I'm hearing a lot, of, a lot of chat about it. So maybe it'll come up this year. It, it's what the, the remarkable thing about what's going on under the, what I call the Wiener Inc. Uh, situation is that the, the legislature is obsessed with market rate housing and they, are, they have abandoned affordable housing. They're not focused and they're just way off the chart. So it would be great if that discussion could come barreling in and pull them back into reality. Well, thank you for that discussion. Thank you, John. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from Mel and then Diane, if you have a question after that. Oh, thanks. I just wanted to clarify for the council member and his planning staff. Oh, okay, that please my do. Question, my question was not about the community plans, which are, I know are going forward and I applaud the planning staff for managing that during this time. Um, but it was about the general plan and the general plan elements that are aside from the community plans and the process as Jill knows had begun. Um, and then the rug was pulled out when it became uh, too open and inclusive. Um, and it, these are some critical elements that the state requires us to include by certain timelines in some cases that really do go to not only housing, but climate adaptation and, and just dozens of other things that we need to be 
taking seriously and planning in, in an inclusive way. And that's going to take time and it's dormant. And I would really love to see some leadership on pushing planning to get that going again. Thanks. And, and uh, uh, I, I was hoping to have Daniel answer that question as well. Um, our community plans are moving along, although from my point of view at a, at a kind of snail's pace for a variety of reasons. But um, where this one is going, I, I'm not familiar. That's why uh, I want to give uh, Daniel another chance to see if he's up on that more than I am. Um, <clears throat> yes, this is, uh, this is Daniel Skolnick. There, there are, in fact, um, other parts, other elements of the community plan that uh, are being worked on, such as the housing element, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, there's also um, uh, the, the thought about opening up the framework element. Um, but uh, it's, it's true that not every aspect of, of the uh, general plan is being updated at this time. And it's really just a matter of uh, funding and staffing, uh, despite the fact that the city of Los Angeles has the, the largest planning department now in, in the nation um, to update uh, every uh, element of the general plan at the same time would, would require um, a, probably a tenfold increase in staff. It's not something that the city could could uh, do at this time without um, state, uh, an enormous infusion of state and federal funding uh, to do so. But uh, little by little, it hopefully will get uh, updated. It just will take time. Great. Just look for the Our LA 2040 plan that begun and then got killed and pushed to move that forward. Thanks. OK. Uh, Mel, do you have a question? Mel, can you unmute? I'll come back to you, Mel. Uh, Catherine, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, if, if you guys don't mind me um, changing topics just a little bit, it's germane to this group. Um, Jill, you've spoken or written in the past about um, LA's urban canopy and where we stand relative to some other more progressive cities. I'm wondering if there's anything developing either in terms of organization initiatives or legislative initiatives um, that you're aware of that would give us hope that someone's paying attention to improving the way we manage the urban canopy in the greater LA area. Well, this week, a, a major deadline ended for um, weighing in on the city's approach to the urban tree canopy. Um, I can't give you much detail because I've been um, jumping in and out of that topic and, and I'm not up to date. Um, but I can tell you that Los Angeles is probably in 20th or 30th or 40th place among the major cities in America for um, protecting its trees. Santa Monica is a really interesting example of a place with tons of development and in the most recent full year, they only allowed three trees to be killed while they did all of this because they, they use the Seattle approach, also known as the Melbourne approach where every tree is protected while they build. Los Angeles still allows mature trees worth tens of thousands of dollars and sucking up all sorts of smog um, to be cut down for temporary equipment storage during a project and other outrageous thing been abandoned 15, 20 years ago in um, Seattle, Austin, different places. Melbourne is the top city in the world for um, protecting its canopy. It's just got a nasty heat, heat problem there. So um, I would say uh, the current administration uh, from the mayor's office is weak, very weak on this. And uh, even though uh, I wrote some very critical things of Viragosa while he was doing his Million Tree uh, project, he actually did a much better job, even though he was always bragging that he'd done more. He actually did a much better job. It's shocking, but he did. We also have uh, had an opportunity to make things worse with one of our programs, which is uh, as a result of uh, a good lawsuit against us. 
we committed to putting in at least $25 million every year for the next 25 years to repair our sidewalks. Uh, but in, in many cases, um, to actually remove and replace a sidewalk, uh, you would have to wind up killing a tree. And so I've tried to get the city to adopt a, a, a more tree focused approach where if they absolutely couldn't cut off part of the roots where the sidewalk is, that they'd make the sidewalk meander around the tree area. And uh, I, I've been pushing that for a while. I don't know how well we've implemented it. Um, but, but certainly if we don't do that, we have the potential to take down hundreds, if not thousands of trees, if not tens of thousands of trees, as we replace uh, you know, that much sidewalk over the next 25 years. And that alone could uh, massively damage our urban canopy. Uh, we're also in the process of inventorying all the trees in the city, uh, which will make it easier for us to track them and preserve them. Um, so that's a couple of things. I've also been pushing for us to add some, some trees to our list of protected trees, which is also pretty weak. Um, so there are a lot of things we could do beyond that. Um, I, I think we are one of the weakest uh, cities in tree protection of, of major cities, but uh, you know, several of us, uh, Bob Blumenfield as well, are pushing to improve that. Well, I know just in the Marina del Rey area, you know, it comes up every year, uh, super aggressive um, trimming and, you know, declaring trees as, you know, uh, dead or dying without having real uh, independent arborists making that assessment. So perhaps it's something that the, um, the Marina uh, group could take up in the future, whether or not there's a resolution or something we could do to bring a little bit more attention to the local tree canopy or issues. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Diane? Can, let's see, Diane, can you unmute? Here, let me see if I can help you. Try it now. Okay. Hi, uh, Councilman Koretz. Uh, thank you, uh, both of you, for this uh, uh, very important conversation. I wanted, I think at some point you spoke as if we, and I wondered if you were talking about the full council is sort of on board with the way you're thinking, or are you uh, a, the Lone Ranger here in? Um, thinking about these issues, because I'd, I'd love to think that the council is in agreement with you, or at least many of them are. Um, I, I knew where we were last year. We've had a number of changes in council members. Um, my best ally on this issue was uh, David Rue, who I've worked closely both on tree issues and uh, wildlife corridor issues in the, the hills that we share. Um, I think uh, his, his replacement uh, is much more open to the trickle down, build lo lots of luxury housing approach. I think uh, uh, generally not that atypical of younger folks who was just assume that if you build more housing, it'll allow them to live in Los Angeles where it's not affordable otherwise. Um, so I, I don't know with this council where the majority is. It took a while with the last council. Um, so I can't predict. I, I'm certainly not a lone ranger. There are certainly some others that feel strongly about this issue and the rest of the council, it's a question of whether we can pull them along or not. Mm -hmm. um, I think with a, a lot of pressure from neighborhood councils and maybe the Sierra Club and homeowners associations, um, that uh, we'll have the ability to get this through again. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Okay. Well, we're coming towards the end of our meeting. So uh, Congress uh, member Koretz, thank you so much for providing us with Congress all of member. this. Congress member, woohoo! With okay, all I'll of this the information. Promotion, but I don't have it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jill, thank you also for being a part of this conversation and providing us with your 
your knowledge and expertise in this as well. We always appreciate your being with us. Um, there are just Thank a couple of things to close. Uh, we appreciate all the hard work you both do for Los Angeles and for all of us. And I'd like to remind everyone here that Sierra Club has not taken a position on the legislation that we've been talking about tonight, just so we're clear about that. So with that, uh, we're ending our meeting. We will keep you posted. The Airport Marina Group will keep you posted as to our future projects and future meetings. We're looking forward to seeing you again. And we'll uh, let you know as soon as we know. So uh, may you. everyone be safe and secure and healthy. And may you all live in peace. Thank you very much. Well, thank Thanks. you, everybody, for having us. Thank you. May it's organic pleasure. be with you. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.